Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, uh, well, it may be the afternoon or the evening, wherever you are, but uh, um, anyway, it's, it's the morning for me. Um, the significance of the Night of the Long Knives. Okay, so in the last lesson, we looked at the actual Night of the Long Knives. Uh, this lesson um, is about why it was important, basically. Um, the, the, the consequences, both the immediate and the long-term consequences. Okay. Um, I'm going to break this lesson down into two YouTube videos um, because there's two sort of like distinctive parts to it. It's quite a lot, quite a lot of material to cover as well. OK, so this is the first part of it. It will cover half the mind map. Um, let's just push on um, the next slide. Um, um, I think probably won't be a surprise to you at the time that we that you did another essay for me. OK, so um, as you can see, it's essay number five. Um, there. Uh, to what extent was the Nazi takeover of power 1933 to 34 a legal revolution? So I'd like you to write that at home um, because things are in lockdown. Um, I need to trust you and I, I know obviously I can because you're only deceiving yourself if you don't do it in this way but it needs to be in self-timed examination conditions without reference to plan or notes okay so um, you need to plan it you obviously need to research it you need to write, write a plan and when you actually um, um, submit it to me i want to see your plan okay so that's something that you need to submit with the essay itself but you but you mustn't have the plan in front of you or your notes in front of you while you write your answer okay once you've written it scan your essay um, ideally, if you can, please, um, some of you with the last essay, when you submitted it, you scanned four or five separate pages. Um, it's a little bit of an inconvenience for me because I've then got to basically use some software to combine them into a single document so that I can record my video commentary feedback for you. Um, if you can submit it as a single document, um, basically just download some scanning software onto your mobile phone or device or whatever and use that. Um, and that should enable you to um, scan a multi-page document and into a single document. Um, I'm sure you can work that one out. Uh, and as I said, I will then video mark your essay and send you the YouTube link as feedback in the assignment area of Teams. So when you upload your assignment, upload it to the assignment area of Teams. And the deadline is by the end of day, Friday, the 22nd of May. OK, so that's actually the last day of this term. Um, any queries, send me a message in chat. OK, now what I'm going to do um, I've written for you here um, two or three pages of guidance. Uh, rather than t take you through this in this particular video, I'm going to record a separate YouTube video. Um, but in the meantime, you can obviously start to work on this. You'll be reading the guidance yourself. Um, and uh, so don't sort of like hang on and wait for the YouTube video. I'll get the YouTube video hopefully sometime within the next week. Um, for this particular question and in the YouTube video it won't be a long um, video I'll, I'll just walk and talk you through the points that I'm making on this slide and on that slide and there and there okay so um, to come on that but at least you can be starting with it um, two knowledge retrieval tasks um, uh, you can do these now, um, pause the video and have a go. Um, there, that's the video. That was um, a slide from the last lesson. OK, uh, the lesson about the origins of the Night of the Long Knives and talking about the extent that Hitler had coordinated the Weimar Constitution and the one aspect that hadn't been coordinated was President Hindenburg himself. And you rem remember from that slide, um, there were boxes around the edge about the Reichstag, civil liberties, the sovereign powers of the states, the judiciary. Um, so what, what were the points that were in those boxes? See if you can uh, remember those. And there's the answer. OK. Um, knowledge retrieval two. Similar sort of exercise. Um, we've been looking at the causes of the Night of the Long Knives. Long-term causes and immediate 
term causes quickly jot down um, what were the long-term causes and remember long-term causes are the reasons why it happened and the immediate causes are the reasons why it happened at that point in time in June 1934 so you're sort of separating it into two long-term causes they explain why it happened but they don't necessarily explain why it happened at that time okay pause the video Okay, so you can obviously cross-reference back to um, last lesson on that one, but you should be able to, to do that. Uh, there's our big picture. Okay, so just a reminder um, that uh, where we are in, the, in, in terms of the depth study. Um, so we're on the third part of creating a totalitarian state. Part one was about the national uprising. Part two was the the enabling act of Glass Shelton. And this part is about the Night of the Long Knives. And it's a two lesson parter. Okay. And in the last lesson we looked at the origins of the Night of the Long Knives, in other words, the halting of a second revolution. And in this lesson we're looking at the significance of the Night of the Long Knives. Um, in the next lesson, or the next three lessons, we will move on to the sort of political structure of Nazi Germany and try to understand those sorts of issues. Okay, um, that's three lessons. And then we'll move on to um, more sort of social aspects, uh, social and economic, um, mainly relevant to the breadth study. Okay, but still focusing in on Nazi Germany. So you'll recognise William Carr and you'll recognise the Stephen Lee book. Um, big focus for this lesson is on this amazing book. It's, 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 it, I read it 30 odd years ago when it was originally published, I think, in about 1988. Um, and it was certainly for me a hugely influential book that really engaged my interest in, in um, Hitler and Nazi Germany, um, The Hitler Myth by Ian Kershaw. So we'll, we'll refer to that. Uh, so on that, follow up reading. Okay. Um, I'll, in, on the Padlet page, I'll put um, a scan of pages 83 to 95, okay? And it's a section called Führer Without Sin, Hitler and the Little Hitlers. And I'll also upload my own notes to that chapter. And it's absolutely superb, okay? It's um, great history, great history writing, uh, a top historian of Nazi Germany at the top of his game, basically, and very, very relevant to this topic about why the Night of the Long Knives is significant. So make sure you download that. Make sure you read it yourself. Don't just go straight to my own notes. Download my own notes. Um, but make sure you read the original and um, scan yourself. And then I have recorded two additional YouTube videos in which I walk and talk you through my own notes to the Ian Kershaw extract, okay? So part one is a YouTube video that's 33 minutes long. Obviously you can't click here because you're looking at the video yourself, but go to the slideshow and click on that in the slideshow and it'll take you straight to the YouTube video, okay? Um, that's, that's part one and then Part two, which focuses on pages 96 to 104, is about the little Hitlers, the image of the local party bosses. OK, so there's two parts to that. And that second part is 29 minutes. So the two videos between them are just over an hour. OK, but um, I walk and talk you through the key points that he's making in that. And you've got my notes OK, so I'm walking and talking you through my notes. So you don't need to make the notes. You just need to listen to the video, have the note, my notes in front of you. But make sure you read the original scan first. OK, so today's lesson then. Um, and so reminder, we're doing two videos here. Um, we're looking at why the Night of the Long Knives was important. So we're going to focus in on the immediate outcome, what immediately changed, the immediate consequence. OK. Um, of the Night of the Long Knives. The outcome, and a good way of thinking about what, what does immediate consequence mean? The immediate consequence is outcomes that were known at that time. 
okay? And then the long-term significance. And those are the eventual outcomes that we as historians can now see, but they were not necessarily known and understood at the time. Okay, it's a useful way of thinking of the difference between an immediate consequence and a long-term consequence, okay, long-term significance. Okay, so today's lesson, specific objectives, okay, they're there for you. Have a quick look at that. I don't need to read them through to you. And there's our mind map, okay. So in this first YouTube video, um, we will go through the key players, the immediate consequences, those that were known at the time, and then we'll start to look at the long term and we'll focus in on the German army, the Reichswehr, okay? Um, and I'll pause there simply because um, the video will become too long otherwise, it'll become an hour and a half probably. Um, and then I'll do a separate video, probably record that tomorrow, upload it for you, and the second video will look at the the importance of the SA and the SS, and in particular the Hitler myth. Um, argument from Kershaw. Okay, so this one, the key players, um, well, I can go through this very, very quickly because this is actually the tail end of the last lesson. We did this in the last lesson, okay, um, and it's exactly the same slide, okay, so um, uh, in a nutshell, let's just um, hone in on that, okay, so who did Hitler use as his executioners? Remember, the key players were two ambitious Nazis, Hermann Goering and Heinrich Himmler. Okay, so Goering and Himmler, who were keen for their own personal ambitions to increase their own personal influence to have Rome removed and to have the power of the SA nipped in the bud. So their motivation was very sort of personal ambition. So that their role was they persuaded Hitler, they put pressure on Hitler to have Rome and the SA leaders murdered. Remember, Hitler wavered for a whole year. And von Papen, remember, gave that speech two weeks earlier on the 17th of June at um, uh, um, the University of Marburg. But that was certainly a, a trigger that helped convince Hitler he needed to do something. But also important was the pressure put on Hitler by Goering and Himmler. Okay. Then in terms of the actual Night of the Long Knives itself, okay, um, the SS, the black shirts, the personal bodyguard of Hitler, um, who were a subsection within the SA, the SS were the executioners, and the SS were led by Himmler. So when Rome and the was murdered on the night of the Long Knives, basically Himmler was ha was was murdering his own boss. Yeah, putting it simply, okay, um, because Rome was his boss. So the actual executioners were him as black shirts, the Schutzstaffel, the protection squads, um, the SS. Um, however, the Prussian army, that great proud institution that has been there for hundreds of years, that built Germany, that was not Nazi, but, but they were help put Hitler into power because they thought Hitler would do good for Germany. On that particular night, their hands became muddied because they became complicit in the murder of, in, in, in murder, basically, because they provided the transport and the weapons, okay? Um, uh, they were used by the SS executions on the night of the long night, so that's something we'll pick up um, a little bit later in this video. So there we are, and we covered this in the last video, so um, don't need to take you through all that again. You can pause the video if you just want to remind yourself, but you will have mapped these exact points um, in the previous lesson. Okay. So we now want to focus in on the immediate outcome. Okay, what immediately happened as a result of the Night of the Long Knives? The immediate consequence. Remember, these were, these were consequences that were known and understood at the time. Okay, so we've done the key players. We're now focusing in on the immediate outcome here. Okay, so what are the key points? In a nutshell, there were two immediate consequences. Okay. A month after the Night of the Long Knives, 
President Hindenburg died of old age in his bed. Okay, remember his health has been failing, and that was one of the triggers that it worried Hitler. Remember, Hitler was worried that if he didn't get the Conservatives on him, on his side, that um, before Hindenburg died, Hitler may have to stand in a presidential election against a candidate put forward by the Conservatives. Okay, so the day after. Hindenburg died, he wastes no time, okay, because Hindenburg died, I think it was the 1st of August, and the day after, on the 2nd of August, Hitler issued a law. Remember, Hitler can make laws now without having to go to the Reichstag, the Enabling Act has given Hitler that power, okay, and the law that Hitler issued abolished the position of president, hugely important, okay, the position of president had been created by the Weimar Constitution back in 1919 um, by Hugo Preuss, when the constitution was written, position of head of state, okay? Now, up until now, Hitler has been chancellor of Germany, head of government. But now that he's abolished the position of president, what he basically did is he merged the position of head of state and head of government into one position, because that law, okay, um, basically combined into one the position of chancellor, head of government, and president, into one position, okay? And the position that was created was called leader and chancellor. Use the German if you can. Führer und Reich Kanzler, okay? Um, and that marked the formal completion of the legal revolution. Um, because remember, that diagram we had of the Weimar Constitution, and we put the little red crosses all over it. Those are the aspects of the Constitution that Hitler had coordinated. But he hadn't coordinated the position of president. Now he has. He's brought that position fully under his control. So that's the, the, the first immediate consequence, um, that it, the, the legal revolution is formally completed. The final obstacle to Hitler's full power has been removed. Now, that took him a year and a half uh, more than a year and a half, because remember Hitler became Chancellor way back in January of 1933, the previous year. So it's, it's quite a long period of time um, to, to achieve that legal revolution. And that's why, with the, remember the essay that you're doing for me for the 22nd of May, it's 1933 to 34. So you've got to basically bring it up to an, include the law of the 2nd of August. Okay, That needs to be part of your essay because that's the completion of, the, uh, of the, um, the legal revolution. The second consequence, so that's the first, con first consequence. The second consequence was that Hitler was now the commander-in-chief of the German army, because um, the position of commander-in-chief of the Reichswehr, and we're using that term Reichswehr, I'm going to stop saying German army, I'm going to be saying Reichswehr, OK, um, that's important as well, because, again, you need to be using the German words in your essays. OK, so the the commander in chief of the Reichswehr was the head of state. So the president, President Hindenburg, had been the commander in chief of the army. And that's was a major that, that's why Hitler was so worried about this, because it, it basically meant in spite of all his powers given to him by the Enabling Act, to pass laws by himself, his power was not complete because he did not control the German army. Now that the Night of the Long Knives has happened and Hindenburg has died and Hitler has absorbed the position of president within this new title, Hitler is now in charge of the German army. Okay, so previously the loyalty and the... the, 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 um, the, the service of the army was to the president now it was to hitler okay so he's in a sense captured the army now as well so that's an important one and we can see that because the day after the night of the long knives the minister of defense who was not a nazi i mean he joined the nazi party um, in 1933 um, but many people did join the nazi party when i say he wasn't a nazi he he was not really an old guard nazi he'd been you know, been a member of the party during the, 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 the years of struggle when the party had been campaigning for power. Uh, Blomberg, like many Conservatives, just sort of like jumped on the bandwagon at the last minute. So this Conservative, General Blomberg, 
publicly thanked Hitler for removing the SA threat. Because remember, the SA was a threat to the army because Ernst Röhm had wanted the two and a half million strong SA to absorb the Prussian army into its ranks. Um, so Blomberg was grateful to Hitler and said, thank you, the army, the army are glad, are, are grateful to you for what you've done. Um, and now Hitler is in effect their new commander in chief. Um, and that was further consolidated in mid-August when every German soldier swore a personal oath of loyalty to Hitler. Okay, um, As the leader of what is now, Hitler is constantly referring to it as the Third Reich. Remember the Second Reich was the Germany of the, the, the Kaisers, the Germany 1871 to 1918, the Germany of Kaiser Wilhelm I and Wilhelm II. Um, now Hitler trying to sort of emphasise the continuity of the new Germany that he is creating with the old Germany before the Weimar Republic and effectively the 14 years of the Weimar Republic have been wiped from memory. Um, in, that's why that title was important. Um, so there we are in a nutshell, the army was captured, okay, there. And we'll develop that a bit further in a moment, but uh, those are the immediate consequences. So the detail that sits beneath it, there we are. You can now add a little bit more detail to your mind mapping. It's got the dates, so he died on the 1st of August. Now the law, um, the law... So he died on the 1st of August. The law was passed on the 2nd of August, the next day. Make sure you get the name of the law. Okay, The law concerning the highest state office of the Reich. And that was the law that basically resolved that issue. Here, remember, there's the diagram. All the red bits were the bits of the constitution that Hitler had previously managed to coordinate. But the one aspect that hadn't been coordinated was the president. Now... That has been resolved. Okay, there's that new title. There's another interesting little detail, and that's relevant to the essay that you're working for, um, you're writing at the moment for the 22nd of May, because it's, was it a legal revolution? Was it legal? Here we've got a relevant piece. Actually, that law was a violation of the, the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act gave Hitler legal authority to deviate from the Constitution Okay, but it explicitly barred him from passing any law tampering with the presidency. Okay, so Hitler stepped beyond the law. Even even as you know, his powers were immense. Yes, the Enabling Act had enormously expanded his legal powers, but Hitler stepped beyond those powers. Okay, so that's an important point that I'll be looking for in your next essay. Further detail, so remember that's really important that Hitler was now head of government, that's a chancellor, he's been chancellor since January 1933, but he's now head of state, that's the position of president, it's now combined, so it made him legally incredibly powerful, okay, and that's especially the case because the position of head of government chancellor had also been considerably strengthened by the Reichstag fire decree that gave that, that um, remember that had two articles power of policing and suspension of civil liberties and then the enabling act that gave the head of government the chancellor the power to issue laws without going to the Reichstag okay so already a very very strong head of government but now he's absorbed the position of the president head of state okay and that that office of president the head of state had been the last obstacle to hitler um, and that obstacle was now removed interesting synoptic point i'll throw in here for you um, you will of course know i hope that um, the equivalent uh, another country that kind of like to a large extent um, uh, similar events had happened earlier um, was Italy, okay, um, and of course Mussolini actually brought about his legal revolution and he seized power um, in a different way from Hitler, okay, but in some way there were some similarities as well, but he basically was a right-wing fascist dictator 
um, who seized power in 1922. Okay, now he seized power illegally, unlike Hitler who seized it legally. Okay, um, remember Hitler in 1923 had marched on, had tried to march on Berlin because he was copying Mussolini in 1922. Mussolini had marched on Rome. Mussolini succeeded. Hitler, of course, in 1923 failed and he ended up in jail. And it took 10 more years before Hitler um, was able to seize power in Germany. But Hitler's seizure of power 10 years later was a legal seizure of power, unlike Mussolini, who used physical violence to, to take power. But the, the point I'm making here about Mussolini is Mussolini was able to create a dictatorship because Mussolini became the head of government in Italy and um, he called himself the Duce, the head of government. But there was in Italy a head of state, the equivalent of the president in Germany, but in Italy the head of state was the Italian king. And Mussolini was never able to deal with the issue of the Italian king. The Italian king was the commander-in-chief of the Italian army and Mussolini was never able to remove the, the Italian king and take personal control over the Italian army. In other words, there was no equivalent of the Knight of the Long Knives in Italy. And that's important because 20 years later, Mussolini took power in the early 1920s. During World War II in 1943, um, Mussolini was deposed by, guess who, the Italian king and the Italian army turned against him. Okay, so that's kind of like a, an important point, therefore, as to why the Knight of the Long Knives was so important. By capturing the position of presidency and by capturing the, the army, therefore, um, he Hitler successfully removed what could have later become an effective threat during the war to him. Okay, um, because... The, the the in Italy the the position of um, head of state was not captured by Mussolini and head of state controls the army and that ultimately was turned against Mussolini. Okay. So there we are now complete. Okay, so um, that diagram just sort of brings it to a close. So you've got all the old aspects, the bits in red, um, way back in nineteen thirty three. Um, the Reichstag had been made an irrelevance by the Enabling Act, civil liberties had been removed by the Reichstag Fire Decree, um, the law for the reconstruction of the Reich of January 1934 had basically um, removed, the, removed the, the lender and it had removed the, the upper house of the, the German parliament. Um, the Enabling Act also um, um, allowed Hitler to coordinate the Supreme Court. Um, now, the position of President and Chancellor is fully combined into this new title, Leader and Chancellor. Okay, Führer und Reich Kanzler. Okay, so the process of coordination is fully complete. The Reichswehr did not contest Hitler taking over the position of president, which he was able to do without an election. Okay, That was Hitler's big worry about having to stand in an election. No need for that to happen now. Okay, Simply the army nodded and said, great, yeah. Hitler declared, passed the law the day after Hindenburg died, and um, which was an illegal law, but the army didn't protest because the army basically were grateful to Hitler for sorting out the SA threat. So the Reichswehr were now unequivocally aligned to the new Nazi regime, and that was shown by the public vote of thanks by Blomberg and also that personal oath of loyalty to the Fuhrer. Every single German soldier, remember there's, there's 100,000 of them, the Treaty of Versailles has capped the size of the German army to 100,000. Every single one of those 100,000 soldiers, I think it was the 18th of August, swore a personal oath and that was a personal oath to Hitler. It wasn't to a position, it was to Hitler himself. Um, and we'll come back on, come to that um, in a minute, or a little bit later when we talk about um, the long-term consequences for the army. Okay, so there we are. We've covered two of our three strands for this video. Um, 
put them onto the mind map for you. Now we're going to move into the long-term significance of the Knight of the Long Knives. There's a lot to talk about here. So in this first video, we're just going to make a start on the long-term significance. And let's develop further this notion of the German army. Okay. And the long-term significance. In other words, remember, that the, 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 when we talk about long-term, we're talking about outcomes that were not necessarily known at that time. Okay. But we as historians writing 70, 80 years later, we've got the advantage of perspective. We can look back and see what was important, okay? Uh, because we've got that advantage of a bigger view, a bigger picture, okay? So what we now know, okay, is what we're saying here. So let's go through this in a nutshell. The Reichswehr was one of Germany's oldest institutions, okay? So we've covered that, okay? It goes way back to almost the beginning of the A-level course. We talked about um, how Germany was formed. Germany was formed by the Prussian army, and the Prussian army in itself, Prussia had been, uh, as a country, um, went for many years before 1871, and it was looked up by other countries, European countries, this institution the prussian army in a sense defined the country of prussia and it, in a sense therefore it defined germany okay so sort of militarism um defined the character of the germany that was created in 1871 bismarck the head of government the chancellor wore a military uniform okay the members of the cabinet in the second reich wore military uniforms because um the, the values of the military, law and order, kind of defined the new Germany because the new Germany had been created by the Prussian army, okay? So it was a very proud institution, okay? Um, old and proud institution. Um, and to be a, a member of the great Prussian army, certainly at the the officer level, okay, the, to, to have a position of command, you simply could not have that unless you were born into these old families, the conservative elites, okay? So the generals, the, 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 the officer class of the, of the army uh, were conservatives, okay? And they were old Prussian families. They were not Nazis, okay? The Nazi movement was a lower middle class, largely drawn from the artisans and the white collar workers. Okay, these were upper class. Okay, that um, controlled, proudly controlled the Reichswehr, and so, as we as we know, they had, they shared many of the beliefs that Hitler, um, had. Okay, um, so Hitler was nationalist. A German patriot like the Prussian generals. Hitler believed in strong authoritarian government and like the Prussian generals, okay? Um, so there was a big overlap in what they believed. But it's so important to understand these Prussian generals were not Nazis, okay? Because they were upper class. They arrogantly looked down on Hitler as a commoner who was working for them that's how they saw it okay so they believed that hitler was serving so that should say own not one was serving their own interests okay uh, working for them so they put hitler into power that's how they saw it we they, they made hitler the chancellor um so the Reichswehr leaders consistently supported Hitler in 1933-34 because they believed that Germany, under Hitler's leadership, would become a stronger, more authoritarian system and that Hitler would do good things for them. Okay, So the army would be restored to its proper position of importance. Remember, the Weimar years were shameful years because the first Weimar government signed the Treaty of Versailles what did the Treaty of Versailles do? It capped the German army to 100,000 men. Okay? And here comes Hitler, and Hitler says, no, I will challenge the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. 
Okay, so they believed that um, Hitler's ambitions um, that he would overturn the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Now, what's really important to understand here is is that they believed Hitler would be able to overturn the terms of the Treaty of Versailles without taking Germany into war. Okay, they saw him as a strong leader who could take Germany back to the conference table and argue a case with the British, the French, and the Americans to have the terms of the Treaty of Versailles relaxed, and that Hitler was strong enough to do that. They didn't want Hitler to take Germany into another war. Now, we now know, of course, as historians, that one of Hitler's ambitions was to wage a war, okay, um, for living space in the East. But if the generals had known that, they wouldn't have backed Hitler. The whole point is, is Hitler, to a large extent, concealed his real ambitions from the generals. Let's just read through, and um, we've jumped ahead a little bit there, let's just pick it up from here. So unfortunately, the army leaders, by supporting Hitler, and by swearing an oath of loyalty to Hitler, which could not be broken... Remember, an oath of loyalty, if you're an army man, the whole, um, the whole idea of an army is a, a, a well-oiled um, military unit. It's based on command. You, you obey your officer. So obedience is written into the blood of a soldier. And so the strength of an oath of loyalty, if, if, you, if you promise obedience to be, to be loyal, then you don't, you don't break that promise because if you start breaking oaths of loyalty then everything that makes an army efficient and great falls apart so when those hundred thousand soldiers including the officers swore that oath of loyalty to hitler in a sense hitler had captured them okay later on um during the war you know when world war ii broke out many of the army officers realized that they had been short-sighted okay so it's understanding that short-sightedness that's important um, because they believed that Hitler's ambitions would stop once he had peacefully, without going to war, overturned the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. And I think perhaps if I could rewrite that again, I'd put that word peacefully in there. Because what they wanted Hitler to do was to overturn the terms of the Treaty of Versailles using diplomatic process. OK, in other words, talking with the leaders of other countries, negotiating with the Allies a fairer settlement by talking, not by fighting with them, but by talking with them. So what they hoped is Hitler would be a strong leader who would return Germ to Germany, for example, land that had been taken from her in 1919, um, that Hitler would persuade the Allies to relax the restrictions on the size of the German army and allowed allow Germany to build up a bigger army. Okay, um, that's what they believed. But they didn't want Hitler to build up an army that would actually be used in a war. So the point here is, little did they realize, little did they realize that Hitler's ambitions were in fact much more ambitious. This is the concealed bit. Historians often talk about Hitler as being a wolf in lamb's clothing. Okay. Um, and maybe, maybe these German generals, if they had actually bothered to read Hitler's book Mein Kampf a little bit more closely, um, they would not have been so short-sighted because in Mein Kampf, Hitler had made pretty clear that his ambitions, if he became leader of Germany, was to conquer land in the East, to wage a war, to take land from countries like Poland and Russia. Um, that Hitler wanted to wage an aggressive war for territory in the east. And this is for territory, not that it had been taken away from Germany by the Treaty of Versailles, but territory that Germany had never possessed in the first place. Okay, It had never belonged to the German people, um, Poland and the Soviet Union. And this is what we call living space, Lebensraum. The reason Hitler wanted this territory in the east, territory that was not rightfully German, OK, was because he believed that the German people were racially superior and they did and they deserved. They had the right because of their superior, what he, Hitler said was their superior blood to have more space to live in. 
and Hitler believed that the people who lived in the eastern territories like Poland and the Soviet Union were of an inferior race, the Slavs, um, and did not deserve to have all of that space. Okay, Now, that ideology did not sit comfortably with the army leaders. Um, the army leaders were nationalist, but they were not racist in the same way as Hitler. There was a degree of racism um, amongst the army leaders, but not to the extent that the Nazis had. So by the time they real the army leaders realised what Hitler's real ambitions were, and they didn't really begin, their eyes weren't really opened until about 19, the end of 1937, beginning of 1938. Then the army leaders began to realise that they had been hoodwinked by Hitler. It was too late. OK, so that's what I mean. When we talk about long term consequences, a, a good way of viewing it is, is the consequences that were not known at the time. These army leaders in 1934 did not realise that they had been hoodwinked, that they had been captured by Hitler um, for his long term plans, which they didn't really know or understand. OK, so because by 1937-38, the power of the Nazi regime was so powerful and Hitler's popularity with the German people was so great by then because by then Hitler had solved the problem of unemployment, created jobs. Um, he'd reached the peak of his popularity by about 1936. It then became very difficult for the army to turn against Hitler. Partly because Hitler was so popular. So even though there were people in the army by the late 1930s who realised, oh, wow, we made a mistake by making Hitler the leader of Germany, uh, by supporting him into power, um, because of his immoral ambitions to wage a war for living space. Um, but also because they were trapped by the oath of loyalty. OK, so all of those factors came into being. So that's a, a, an important sort of conceptual thing about, about the Reichswehr being trapped. So the detail, again, look at the in particular the, the bits in bold. Have you, uh, make sure you add these to the mind to the mind map. Okay, so I'll just pull back a little bit. So there's that important bit. The Reichswehr leaders were Prussian junkers, conservative elites. Remember the the vocabulary is important. Backers of the Nazis, but not actually Nazis. There's that key one. They did not want war. And eventually, in 1939, when war was declared and Germany went to war against Poland for living space, and then against the Soviet Union in 1941 for living space, the army leaders were, to a large extent, pulled into a war that they did not believe in. But they had been trapped by the, two, by the um, Knights of the Long Knives. Okay? So they backed Hitler into power because they wanted a strong leader, who would revise the Treaty of SI. Now that word revise is important because revise basically means we talk about revisionism. Okay? And that's what the army wanted Hitler to do, to revise the terms of the Treaty of SI, which implies by negotiation, remember, diplomatically. Okay? Talking to the leaders of other countries. Okay? And they arrogantly believed that Hitler was their puppet. He was working for them because what Hitler had, was doing he, is he was popular, popularising the idea of nationalism. Um, he, Hitler, in their, in their eyes, Hitler's great achievement was that um, in the Weimar Republic, millions of Germans were distracted to left-wing ideas. They were pulled away from nationalism. They were believers in internationalism, socialism and things like that. And what Hitler did is he he made, he sold the idea of support your country, that's the most important thing. And so millions of ordinary Germans um, from the lower classes were pulled over um, to support the nationalist idea. And that's something, of course, the upper classes, I mean, look at this guy here, I mean, the upper class um, with his monocle and because of who they are and their wealth, it was very difficult for them to sell nationalism to the German people, whereas Hitler was able to do that because he was closer to the ordinary people because he was lower middle class. Okay, But 
That arrogance, looking down on Hitler as working for them, was their fatal flaw. They didn't realise that Hitler was using them. Hitler was using the Conservatives. They thought they were using Hitler, but it was actually the other way around. And Hitler was using them, hoodwinking them, bringing them on board with his plans, and capturing them to prepare for an aggressive war of eastward expansion for living space, which is something that they, these people never really wanted. There's a photograph of the... Um, um, 100,000 of them, you've got to imagine 100,000 of them, they were lined up in fields, raised their hand, and they swore a personal oath to Hitler. It wasn't to the office of Führer and Reich Chancellor. In the, the oath, they actually used the word Hitler himself. So Hitler had trapped this proud Prussian, enormously proud institution that had existed for hundreds of years. It was a highly moral organisation, um, you know, proud, strong belief in doing the right thing. Hitler had it trapped, OK, because they gave him now unconditional support. And eventually doubts did creep in, OK. But there's that thing, an oath of loyalty is almost a sacred thing for a soldier not to be broken. And that is the real significance here. Because when those doubts eventually settled into their heads, in particular to the Prussian generals, and that was in particular in the late 1930s and during World War II, it made it very, very difficult for them to oppose Hitler. The final resort was, we can't do it. We can't oppose him because we have, we have sworn loyalty to him. Now, got to be slightly hit, hit, careful here. There were some generals later on in World War II who were able to overcome that. And they, they looked at Hitler's, what he was doing, and in particular um, shaken up, some of them, by the monstrous policies that Hitler was introducing in the occupied territories with the murders of civilians and the Jews, etc. And some generals during World War II were, in the end, said, we may have made an oath of loyalty, but nothing can justify supporting this man. And in July 1944, there was an army plot to have Hitler removed. Okay, And so some um, brave Prussian officers um, made that eventual decision. But notice the date, 1944. It took them until 1944 before they were able to overcome this issue about we've got a duty to support this man. OK, so that's why the uh, the oath, oath of loyalty was important. OK, so the leaders have been duped, hoodwinked, whatever word you want to use there. For the next three to four years, they continue to believe that Hitler would serve their, would continue to serve their interests. They they were blind. They they they, they saw the lamb. They didn't see the wolf. OK, remember, Hitler was very good at dressing himself up as being something different. Hitler dressed himself up as somebody who did not want war. He dressed himself up as somebody who, I want to make Germany strong, I want to renegotiate the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, I want to revise the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, there's that word revisionism, without going to war. And the army believed him, but actually Hitler did want to go to war. OK. That's the important thing. And it wasn't until 1937 that they began to realise the folly of their own actions, the fact they had made this. So they were naive. They naively continued to believe that Hitler's foreign policy aims were, again, the vocabulary is important, defensive and revisionist. Working through diplomatic means. OK, so pick up those keywords, make sure those keywords go into your mind map. And you use them in your essays. OK, um, so there's that word naive again. There were rumours. OK, undoubtedly, we know that as historians, we um, have got access to documents. And these Prussian army leaders in 1933 were having conversations with each other saying, well, have you not read Mein Kampf? He talks about grabbing land from Poland and Russia for living space, etc., etc. But they chose not to believe the rumours. They deliberately 
um, found excuses and said, oh, well, that was just a hit in the back in those days was radical. And he's now, he's, you know, we, we, we've smoothed off those rough edges and he's not like that anymore. OK, so they managed to convince themselves um, that um, to ignore those rumours. OK, but Hitler, his real long term plans were aggressive, a war of conquest and a brutal, immoral war. OK, that would enslave the people of the eastern territories um, and make them subservient to what Hitler believed were the superior German race. Um, so these this proud, highly moral German institution, the Prussian army, um, was complicit. OK, it had now was captured by gangsters. OK, um, remember as well, on the night of the Long Knives, they provided the transport for murder. OK, so blood was on their hands. So the army was no longer a proud, you know, it has become complicit in crime. OK, so it tainted the Prussian army. And you can never, once done, you, you can never, never recover from that. OK, they have become... Um, complicit in working with basically a gangster okay so there we are I'll stop at that point um, we need to finish off this lesson I'll do a separate YouTube video probably tomorrow and upload that for you and we'll look at the other long-term issues first of all what did it mean for the SA and in particular the SS okay and then we'll talk about the Hitler myth argument by Kershaw and why that was important um, so the next video will start from that slide okay that's it for me hopefully that was useful for you do your mind mapping um, hope everything is good with you and i will sign off now thank you